for this panel, we will ha have a little more time, and that is good since we are we have four panelists. Uh, we'll use the the sixty minutes uh, uh, for uh, to talk about um, how we get from all the knowledge the technology provides us with to smart decisions. Uh, we will also deal with the security issues of a world where all devices and human beings are interconnected. Will we give up, give up uh, our privacy in return of convenience? This was something we touched in the last panel as well. Uh, can we release the potential of the technology if we don't give up uh, at least uh, some of our anonymity? In this panel, we will hear from people who are working with these questions uh, and thinking about them while they are actually deeply involved in the invention of the future. As with the other panel, you will have uh, some time to, to introduce the audience uh, to your thinking, and then we'll have a short discussion here, and there will be time for one or two questions, maybe more one than two. We, we will have to see how it goes along with the time. Let me first, int first introduce the, the panel. This is Joris Janssen, is that Very correct? Yeah, yeah, he's the Dutch uh, and uh, a visiting scholar at Media X. And you work uh, currently uh, as a senior researcher here at Stanford at Sense Observation Systems. Now you're working back in, in Holland actually, yes. but together with Stanford. Yep. Uh, you hold a master in artificial intelligence. Yep. That used to be something from the movies. <laughs> now it's something you, you really work on. And a PhD in human technology interaction. And you work with a wide range of uh, topics in this arena, including, including persu persuasive technology, virtual reality, behavior change, and home healthcare. Uh, Phil Levis, mm -hmm. uh, you're an associate professor at the Computer Science and Electrical Engineering Departments of Stanford University, where you work with wireless networks, sensor networks, and embedded systems. Uh, Levis heads the Stanford Information Networking Group and holds the Fletcher Jones Faculty Development Chair. Mm -hmm. Greg Dips. Uh, Greg Dipp, actually, is senior manager responsible for the uh, strategy and operations at Nissan Motor Company. Uh, you are working at the Nissan uh, Research uh, Center in Silicon Valley in Sunnyvale, uh, where they develop automated cars aiming to invent the self-driven car. Beside the self-driven car, uh, they work with connected vehicles and the intersection between the human beings and the machine, which is not, uh, not complicated, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> And then uh, Sham uh, Pilalamari uh, is the chief technology officer of Samsung SDS Research America, where he has to make the hard choices in what he describes as a new phase of mankind, where the possibilities and complexity are greater than ever, and where we have a multitude of digital and technological uh, revolutions happening at, one, at once. Uh, you are a, a true engineer of this valley, have been involved with a lot of startups uh, and in a lot of companies. Uh, and now you're trying to, you know, make uh, a kind of a startup culture within Samsung as well. Uh, and first, uh, we will begin here in this end of the panel. Joris Janssen, take it away. Thank you very much, Naya, for your introduction. So I work for Sense. Uh, Sense is a Dutch startup company in the Netherlands. Uh, we have about 20 people in Rotterdam and a team in Bandung, Indonesia, for development. Uh, and we work on personal context awareness. And during this talk, I will try to to explain to you what we mean with that, uh, give you a couple of examples of applications that, we, uh, that we've built to give you an idea of what can already be done with the sensors that everybody has in their pocket nowadays uh, that are built into your smartphone. As you saw in the previous presentations, there is, uh, there's an abundance of sensors coming about. And uh, as a software company, what we try to do is try to make sense of all the sensor data uh, that is out there, because just the raw information is not very useful in many ways, in many cases. Uh, but combining all these sensors can, can lead to really interesting information. Um, so that's what we try to do. So our mission is to turn sensor data into personal context awareness using smart algorithms. This is really the mission on the technology side. And that's also what we started off a couple of years ago. Uh, so we built a, a really great scalable cloud pa platform. We will build really smart algorithms to, uh, we connected all kinds of external sensors, smartphones, smartwatches, Fitbits, all these kinds of things. And then uh, we built out APIs on top of that uh, so that everybody could use this technology. And then we realized pretty quickly that people didn't get it. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. Nobody really understood what they could do with this kind of technology yet. Um, so what we started to do is actually build applications on top of that ourselves. Um, 
So the second part of the mission is to create empathic coaching applications that support the user and their network. So using this kind of technology to support behavior change, uh, uh, we focus mainly on healthcare and employee vitality right now um, um, to support users uh, living more healthy lives for specific diseases and support their network. So data is always a really great way of connecting people or supporting communication and connections between people. And that is on all our applications, it's never for one user. It's always for a user and their network. And in all these cases, uh, users have uh, full control and ownership over their data. So this is a little bit different from uh, what a lot of other companies are doing, uh, but we believe that, uh, that, that, that this is one of our, uh, one of our very important values. Uh, so we don't own the data. Um, users can decide what they want to do with their data, if they want to delete it, if they want to share it with people, or if they just want to keep it on our servers, that's all fine. Uh, but we won't show it to anyone, we won't sell it, all these kind of things. And this is also a question that is, or a point that has become much more relevant over the last uh, half a year. Uh, every company that I talk to, every customer that we uh, connect with, uh, this is always the first question. What happens to the data? What, what, what about my privacy? And this is a very sort of convincing answer for them. So to give you an idea uh, of three applications that we, uh, that we have done so far. Uh, first one, this one, uh, EU, EU eHealth Award is an application for people with depression. Um, so this we did together with the Mental Health Institute in the Netherlands. We often team up with the specific domain experts in a certain field. Uh, people with depression, uh, especially in the first phase of their therapy, they're very passive and they need to reactivation, what the therapists call it. So they sit down on the couch, they don't get off the couch or they sleep in late. Uh, they're very socially isolated. They eat very irregularly, they sleep very irregularly. Um, what they were already doing is together with their therapist, they set goals. Uh, uh, during the therapy to behave more healthy. Uh, but what we're offering now that, to them is, is a tool that they can take home that actually shows them their goals, uh, real time, uh, measures the progress towards these goals in real time, so how active they are, when they sleep, uh, how, how, how much social interaction they have, when they eat, all these kind of things, and then provide real time coaching. So positive reinforcement when the behavior is good, advice when things need to be improved, and at the same time the therapist can also sort of look over the shoulder of the patient to see what's going on, adjust the therapy uh, where necessary based on, uh, uh, based on the measurements. Um, this has been tested with a, a, a large group of patients so far, very positive results both from therapists and patients, and we're now doing an, uh, a cost-effectiveness trial with a group of 400 patients in the Netherlands to see if this also improves the efficiency and the efficacy of the, of the therapy. Another example is for rheumatoid arthritis patients. So this is an autoimmune disease that uh, is very, it's quite unpredictable. Uh, it's very painful from time to time um, and can flare up at any time. And patients often have a lot of problems getting it under control. Um, and for all kinds of patients, um, different, different situations or different contexts or different behaviors trigger their disease. So it can be the weather for some people. For other people, it can be sleep, uh, stress at work or time spent traveling, all these kind of things we can measure. Uh, and by measuring it over a longer period of time, having patients manually track how they feel, uh, how much pain they have, how much stiffness they have in their joints, uh, we can give them insight into how to better manage their disease. They can share it with a nurse, nurse practi practitioner with their GP um, to discuss their medication regime, for instance, and, and see how they can adjust it better to better cope with their disease. So, so again, an ap another application of using context awareness technology, using sensors uh, from our smartphones, very easy, actually. Uh, everybody has it with them already, and uh, we can get this kind of information to make their lives much, much easier. The third application, uh, this is now white labeled for ASML. It's a launching customer. Uh, this, is, uh, this is pretty fresh. Uh, it's uh, geared towards employee vitality, specifically towards shift workers and people who do a lot of intercontinental travel, uh, and focuses on supporting people in their biorhythm when they shift, uh, shift uh, to different time zones or when they take on different shifts, night shifts, day shifts, things like that. So by being able to measure when they normally sleep, what their exercise patterns are like, we can actually give them very personalized and very good advice on how to deal with these shifting time zones. Uh, so when, when should I go to sleep? Now, I just landed two days ago from Europe. Um, it's better to have daylight uh, from 3 p.m. to 5, 6 p.m. and then go to, st go to bed early, don't take caffeine, uh, do morning light exercise, do, do all these kind of things. We can, we can coach them and support them 
by using this context awareness technology. So these are three examples of the things that we, we are doing. These are just three con concrete examples of what we can already do nowadays. Um, um, and I think we'll leave these. Um, so some, maybe I'll, I'll go in. Do I have time? Shall yeah, I go into you, a couple you can points? take a, look, uh, a minute more. A minute more. So um, let's talk about context aware privacy policy. So um, what is very, what we've come to realize is that we really want to give control to the user about their data, about their privacy. But it's also very hard to make intuitive interfaces or to really make it uh, easy for them to control this data because they don't want to be burdened by, by, their, by, by having to control their privacy. So what we're trying to do now is making it context aware. So using all this real-time sensing to also adjust when you share data with somebody. So maybe you want to share uh, your location or your uh, activity when you're in the office uh, with your colleagues. Uh, but not when you're at home. Maybe you want to share um, information with your physician when you're in the same room with your physician. This way we can actually adjust privacy policies in real time based on the context that you're in. Another thing is device redundancy and independency. So what we're also seeing is that um, I have a phone with me, I have a Fitbit with me. They both track my steps. And there's actually a lot of redundancy already in information and we should, um, we should leverage that more to on the one hand, come to better, uh, more accurate measurements of, of what's going on. And on the second hand, also when one of the devices is turned off or I forget one or, or the other, um, my steps should still be measured. So it should, should be personalized. It should be centered around me and not around specific devices. Um, and I think those were the main points. Thank you. Thank you, Joris. And Phil Levis. Thank you. Uh, so this is me. So hi, uh, yeah, I'm an associate professor uh, here in computer science and electrical engineering. So I have a very technological, technological perspective uh, on these questions of embedded sensing and human sensing. Um, and if you look, and, and I don't think this is surprising to anyone here, over the past couple of years, we've seen the emergence of suddenly these embedded sensors that are controlling ourselves uh, and our homes. Uh, and our objects. We see smart objects, we see smart homes in a way which we had always envisioned, say, 10 years ago, but which hadn't really started to happen. And so here I can get smart socks and I can get smart shoes and I can get smart picture frames and smart water bottles and even now smart uh, credit cards, the coin. Um, I can sense myself in all kinds of different ways, whether it's the Fitbit or the Up or the Basis. But the thing is, if you look at the explosion of applications in the web in the past six to eight years, right, we've seen this tremendous explosion of all of these new things we can do with this digital technology. All of these were built to some degree on sort of a shared software infrastructure in the sense that we have all of these services, all of these pieces of software, all of these abstractions, which let us very, very quickly take an idea such as uh, allowing people to share their uh, homemade crafts build an application for it, which allows people to then uh, share uh, and do commerce. And then, as and if it gains popularity, that framework to use to very quickly build that application, you might outgrow it, and then you can begin to evolve what your underlying software and system looks like to meet the, the needs of that growing application. And so this is this uh, article from The Economist uh, back in uh, January saying, look, the reason why we're seeing this explosion of all of these web applications is in part because exactly of this computing infrastructure, this infrastructure of services and software, which makes it very easy to build something at small scale, test it, evaluate it, and iterate, it, iterate on it. And then if it grows, you can begin to replace all of those constituent parts as needed. But if you look today, Embedded sensing applications do not have such an infrastructure. They do not have these software services or these computing infrastructure in order to do this. Instead, although the dominant sort of application model you see today is I've got a bunch of low power devices, say you know, my, my human sensors uh, or um, some other kind of environmental sensor, you then go to some kind of gateway over a personal area network, a home area network protocol, uh, say your phone if it's a personal area network or you know, the, the Cisco widget on the wall if it's a, a home area network. This then talks TCP IP back to the cloud to do your analytics, talking over the internet. But today, what this means is you're writing software in three different places on three different kinds of devices, some kind of embedded C code on the sensors, then maybe Objective-C if you're using iOS, or Java if you're using Android, and then something in the back end for your web service. This is this sort of fragmented thing where you have to 
put the pieces together, and it's messy and it's hard, and everyone does it themselves. And so the goal of this project uh, that I'm leading here at Stanford uh, with you know, great Neil, a great deal of uh, absolutely fantastic colleagues is we want to make it as easy to build a modern sensing application as it is a modern web application. So that you should be able to very quickly, rather than taking a year and 10 engineers or a year and three engineers, it should take a couple months and two people. But the key question, one of the key questions that come out from this, and I think in the context of this panel is especially important, is can we do this while still preserving end-to-end -end security? In the sense that we saw with the web is all of these applications came out, people built lots of systems, and then there are tremendous security holes which we're still trying to patch and repair. An example of the heartbleed bug would be a good example of this. And so can we build such a framework while preserving end-to-end -end security? And so starting to dis, uh, define and build this software infrastructure and framework called Ravel um, that basically allows you to build applications that cross these three tier of, tiers of devices, the sensors, the gateways, um, and then the back end. And the idea is that you can write some simple application across these devices in a single language and then have it work on all these different devices. Um, and there are a couple sort of technical concepts in there. We're starting with the idea of a model view controller, like what you see in normal web applications, and extending it to allow you to transform models. So I can actually process my sensor readings as they go from, say, my uh, smart uh, watch all the way up then into uh, the cloud and then back down to the device I want to look at it, say, with my, my phone. What's really key here is this idea that you want security and privacy across that whole pipeline. I shouldn't have to trust where I'm storing the data. I shouldn't have to trust necessarily that there's no malware on my phone. And so the idea here is that you can perhaps build the system to have by default end-to-end -end security. So when a sensor reading or some data emerges from my device, it's encrypted, and it doesn't become decrypted until actually my application at the other end of that entire pipeline looks at it and uses it. And so it turns out there's been some really great research in the past couple of years establishing that this is possible, something called homomorphic encryption. The idea is that I can take some value S and I can encrypt it, and then I can perform arbitrary computations on it without actually revealing what it is. So I could put all my encrypted data in the cloud, and then it could do computations on it for me without knowing what it is and without being able to find out. The problem, of course, is that this turns out to be a million times more expensive than normal computation, so it's not yet practical. Uh, but it turns out you can make it practical for certain narrow computations, like, say, addition. And so one of the big questions is, how can we take this sort of new security technology and then perhaps provide end-to-end -end security for these applications? And this basically is going to raise a whole new question of what are the computational models of these systems as they generate data and stream them? Um, for example, it's absolutely possible to do computations on large sets of data without revealing your own data. For example, we could have everyone in this room reporting uh, their activity, and you could know that you're in the 85th percentile without ever having to tell anyone else how active you are. Um, similarly, you could say, I'm not going to reveal how much energy my house consumes to these services, but it can tell me that I've consumed 120% of my average load. So it can compute these statistics without actually revealing what the data is. And so all of these questions as to where this will happen, how it will happen, what the mathematical primitives are, Plus also, maybe you just don't want to put things in the cloud at all. Maybe you'd like to keep things local. And I think just pushing things into the cloud is not a suitable answer for these problems. And so what I'd say is we don't want to think just about particular pieces of technology, right, or even particular applications. It's too easy to build a vertical slice. But instead, we want to think about what is the framework that we think about these applications in? How, what is sort of the architecture that we would develop them in to make them easy to develop, um, and yet that way incorporate automatically security and other properties that we want. So we don't make the same mistake 100 times by having uh, security bugs in our software. It's going to involve some new computational tools, some new programming abstractions, uh, and we're having a lot of fun doing that. OK. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Greg? Greg did. Yeah. So I'll just have you start one in a second. So. My name is Greg Dibb, and I'm at the Nissan Research Center nearby in Sunnyvale. I've been there a little over a year. We actually opened it up in February. We had our grand opening, and we're real excited. We focus on autonomous vehicles, on connected vehicles, and on human-machine interaction. So I'm going to mostly talk about autonomous vehicles. Really, all three of those can be the same thing. All three of our research domains really end up with a car that the human loves 
and can use sometime in the near future. So uh, first I'm going to talk about the four levels of automated vehicles, which are defined by NHTSA, which is a national highway for transportation and safety administration. And so there are four levels, well, not counting level zero, which is no automation. And if you look at the progression of the automobile over history, it started out as a very mechanical thing. I mean, you would crank it to start it. Um, and, and even as recent as 30, 40 years ago, you, you'd have a carburetor, gosh, even 25 years ago, you'd have a carburetor. So when you push on that accelerator pedal, it pulls a physical cable which then opened valves on your carburetor, which let, uh, you know, which let more of the fuel air mixture in, which then accelerated your car. It was all very mechanical. And now, as you, as you will see in some of these videos, and I'm sure as you've experienced in your own cars, it's becoming more of a computer on wheels, and maybe even more like a robot. So, so that's the transformation that we're in, thanks to the technology and thanks to a lot of Moore's Law, which is increased computational power. So the first video is about, um, oh, so level one, level zero was all mechanical. Level one is at least one function on the car is automated. And you've had that if you've had anti-lock brakes. So as Cliff Nass used to, used to say, anti-lock brakes was really when you pushed on your brake pedal, it was just a suggestion to your car that you should brake. The car would figure out, the car would look at the sensors and figure out the rotation of the wheels and say, yeah, it's a good time to brake, we can brake. But if it thought the rotation was a little bit off, then it would, it would actuate the anti-lock braking system, which would pulsate the brakes and actually, without you really asking, it would brake in a safer manner. So the first video here, can you start it around? Um, it would be, the, no, the, the big one you got going there. So, so yeah, go ahead and hit play. So this is an example of this technology unlike anything else available to So this is an example of the Infinity Q50 which we sell today. I can get you an employee discount just let me know. Predictive forward collision and, warning. And and these Infinity's are some of the technologies that are that we're selling today on, on the roads. Enables the Q50 to not only tell you if there's something up ahead, but is able to detect the car ahead of the one directly in front of you and its relation to that car. So if you've seen this commercial before, like the orange truck starts to crash three cars in advance, and the this radar knows the cars in advance are slowing down and slows you down. Infinity Safety Shield combines a suite of modern technologies to provide you and your passengers 360 degree safety protection. She's going to show a few features more like features here. Distance control assist, blind spot warnings, forward emergency braking, and advanced restraints, airbags, and vehicle structures. So that was a lot of things she just listed off. Collision and to protect you and your passengers should an unavoidable accident occur. Okay, so there it is, only $49.95 at your local Infinity dealer. I'm just kidding, I don't know how much it is. But, but it's, there's a lot of beautiful technologies in there that really bring us into level two and closer to level three. Level two is multiple, uh, multiple functions of the vehicle automated at the same time. So in this case, the vehicle is detecting if there's any emergencies out in front of you that it needs to alert you to and or slow down if you don't respond. Um, adaptive cruise control, which has actually been out for a while, literally detects the vehicles in front of you. And if you're on cruise control and, and maybe not paying attention, it sees the car and starts to slow down in advance. Then you've got lane keeping. So the car knows where the lanes are and it tries to keep you centered. And in fact, in the Q50, you can go on 280 for a few miles at a time and the car just keeps you in the lanes and, and goes straight and doesn't run into the car in front of it. So you're already starting to arrive at level three, which is uh, where the functions are automated sufficiently that the human can uh, for safely, that the car can operate itself safely for periods of time. So uh, here's another one. Let's start this one about 30, 40 seconds in, if you don't mind. Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. Right there. So this is, an, this is not yet on vehicles, but um, we're working on it. And this would be an example where now it really starts to take even more proactive stance. So you're driving down the freeway. And there's an emergency stop in front of you. Everybody slams on their brakes. So watch the steering wheel. Okay, so the car detects, wow. Instant obstacles, I can't stop in time. And you'll see on the next traffic, it can sense to the left and to the rear and see that there's clear space, here we go. So it can sense to the left and to the rear is clear. So it's more likely that I, I will safely maneuver around this vehicle than I will stop in time. And so it will do that without really asking, right? Now, the, the key and what we'll talk about is how do you really integrate that in a good way with the, with the driver so that it's, that it's intuitive and useful. Okay, that's good. So, so now we start to get into level three, a, a, few, a few more technologies, and now the car is driving 
itself, and the human is, is pretty much free to maybe do some other things. And so it seems like we're really close. Um, obviously, there's a lot of other things that, that have to take place there. And then, and then when you realize uh, some of the things that you can encounter on the road, now you wonder, well, wait, how close are we where, where the human is out of the loop? So one more video. Um, yeah, I'll just go ahead and start this. This is some test driving that I was doing in Russia the other day. Look at my big fat... Just kidding, this wasn't really me. I found this on YouTube. So you start to, when you start to go around the world and look at the different driving conditions and the different kind of things that your computer might run into, you know. So we're, prog we're just in case, we're programming. If a helicopter fries in front of you and starts to land, slow down. Right? Um, and then the, the horse decides to cross in front of you. You need to be ready for that too. Okay, you can go ahead and stop it now. You really should look this up. There's a lot of really amazing things. That, so, uh, so, but this is interesting because for various reasons, the majority of cars in Russia have, have dash cams and record this on their car. And so, so you can just find the most amazing things. And, you, and thanks to these sensors that are installed in cars, and they're mostly aftermarket, um, it's, it's amazing the things you see. Wow, that can happen on the road? And now how do we plan for that? And so what you start to realize is in, the, in these open systems, in these open systems where almost anything can happen, uh, it, it can be very complex to completely remove the human. And so what's really key for us and what we focus on at our lab is uh, how do we design a system where the human and the autonomous vehicle are, are teammates? And so really, really the vehicle uh, leverages the intelligence of the human. So the things that the computer does well, the vehicle does well and acts as a teammate. And the analogy that we use is, is an equestrian and, and a horse. So they act together as one and you leverage the strengths of both teammates to really be um, a, 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 an amazing drivers. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and last, Sean Pilar Lamari. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Sean Pilar Lamari. I work for Samsung SDS. So we do have a little um, part we play in the ecosystem of all these sensors and phones and the wearables and so on. But I don't have a presentation, so you know I'm just going to uh, speak from. A little bit about, I wanted to um, actually take a step back and look a little bit about the philosophically around the title of the, pa you know, the, the panel itself, which was ubiquitous sensors and interconnected security. So one of the things I think we are already beginning to see the shift, at least that's my belief, is up until now, sensors did a very specific thing. Like you had a sensor for sp specific activity you know, or specific information. And I think that's going to change. All of a sudden, we won't even recognize what a sensor is. A uh, classic example I'll give you today is um, if you're watching, uh, you know, if you, if you look back about 20 years ago, the way people found out about what programs were, uh, were being watched by how many people and hence how much to charge the advertisers were most of you people know about these Nielsen ratings, right? And the way Nielsen did was actually they had a sample of the population, maybe some 10,000 households in the whole of US, and they would actually record every single uh, uh, TV show that they would, they, they would watch. And that's how they would take a sample of that. It was, it was representative, and they figured out what to charge. But today, if you look at something like Netflix, every single thing you do with your Netflix, everything from pausing it to fast forwarding it to rewinding it to seeing it multiple times, every single piece of that is being recorded. Right? Every single action of yours is now is being stored. Right? Netflix knows exactly what you did, how long you took to watch it, whether you stopped in the middle and walked out and watched it, if you rewound a cer certain specific scene, it's all there, it's all available. So I think part of the thing is you're beginning to see more and more of that, and similarly you're seeing that with smartphones as well. More and more functions are being put into everyday things that you interact with. And in some senses you can call them sensors, in some senses they may be just things that you do normally, but that's being uh, tracked, cataloged, stored for eventual use. In some cases, we don't even know what the use case may be. Right? So that, I think, is the first. In my mind, ubiquity, is, in, in terms of sensing, is, is, is different than what we normally think about. Oh, there is a sensor here, there's a sensor there. Not that. I think it's just so pervasive, we won't know what's sensing what and of whom even. Right? So that's the first part of it. The second part of it, if you look at it, is you wonder, we are getting into the situation where everything you do is, is being tracked, right, in some sense, is being stored, is being cataloged. 
why wasn't this being done 10 years ago or 15 years ago? And I'd argue that's because of, because of some of the trends that have happened all collided at the same time. So if you think about it, I don't know, about, let's say, 30 years ago, um, cost to store a gigabyte would have been prohibitive, right? If you think about the storage cost of a gigabyte 30 years ago was probably, I'd guess, I don't know, maybe $200,000. I'm just taking a guess, but it's probably somewhere in that order. Now it's below 10 cents. So all of a sudden, all these Facebooks and Googles and Pinterests and all these things that are storing just vast amounts of data can afford to do it. You couldn't do it if the economics weren't there. Similarly, in order to process it, we keep talking about all the processing power needed for big data and data analytics. Think about the same scenario. If 30 years ago, it would have cost you probably $5,000 for a megabyte of memory, now it's under probably two cents. Right? Same thing with computational power. You would have needed supercomputers that would have cost $10 million 30 years ago. Now you're, the equivalent uh, processing power is probably 100 bucks on your Galaxy Tab or iPad or whatever the case may be. So you see the economics that are driving some of the things that you can do today that just won't be possible or wouldn't have been possible before. Then there is the whole notion around open source. If you think about it, I think somebody mentioned here that the whole paradigm of how you're delivering services, how you're delivering software has changed completely. And that's part of the reason is the whole open source community, which is only about less than 10 years old, to be honest. You know, it's about 10 years since the whole thing has started. Now there are over half a million projects. There are probably 20 billion lines of source code that have been generated that people have access to instantaneously. It's not like in the previous cases where if I'm a small you know, company with three people wanting some piece of software, you had to go beg, plead everybody, and Microsoft used to give out a few copies, and then after five, then you would have charged them, and so on and so forth. All that's changed, right? So I think you look at all these trends. These trends allow you to do the kinds of things with the kind of data that you're able to generate. And I think that's what I, we feel looking at it from the, from the broader perspective is, the sensors, the computation, the use cases are all, in some senses, we don't even know where this is all going to head. You know, it's, it's, that's the kind of thing that we're beginning to see. Simple example I'll give you is in healthcare. If, you know, if, I'm sure most of you have, have gone to the doctor and when they ask you, especially about your habits, if they say, how many times do you exercise every, day, every week, you're going to say five, even though you do twice, right? So how much are they supposed to trust you? Maybe you're actually very truthful and you say, I only exercise twice. I go in there, I tell them five times. Now they have to calibrate this and figure out which is right. Now, whereas on the other hand, if you had sensors or if you had your smartphone that actually recorded all your steps or your Fitbit, they don't need to ask you. If they have access to that data, all of a sudden their diagnosis could be that much better, even without all the Dr. Watson and all the, the analytics around it. Just the fact that there is data that's accurate for your, for your physician is a huge step. And this is where, again, the sensors are coming in, is a lot of these just, you can get fairly simply. The flip side of it is, you know, you had some episode, you went to the hospital, you got treated, and you came home. And this generally tends to happen with surgeries or chronic disease management and so on and so forth that we see. Half the time, the patient is unaware whether or not a specific symptom that they develop after the episode is something that they should rush to the emergency for or not. So more often than not, either some people err on the side of being uh, cautious, and so they run to the emergency even though it's not necessary. And in some cases, people will just procrastinate, and that actually ends up being not a good patient outcome. So all of these, again, there are tremendous use cases that you'll start seeing when you have sensors that are ubiquitous that are actually measuring simple things. It doesn't have to be things that, that are fancy, even just simple things tell, for example, the, the physicians a lot about your health and eventually for your patient outcome. So that's all the great stuff that, that we see, right? Whether it's in retail, I think uh, Rick pointed out all the great things you can do in retail, similarly in uh, healthcare, potentially in education. But then the flip side comes is, okay, with all of this data that's out there, what about privacy and security, right? The whole interconnected security that we keep, keep talking about. And I think the biggest issue in some senses that we all worry about is, to a T, I think all of us are of the opinion that I'm willing to give up a lot of my data to specific individuals or specific organizations that I have some belief and confidence in, as long as I'm getting something in return for free. Right? That's kind of how all, I think, human beings operate, at least most of us. 
And, and, and so I look at that and go, okay, maybe we trust Google or maybe we trust some other company and we say, okay, this much, this kind of information I'm willing to give because it gives me in return this benefit. But then the problem is you start you know, taking, let's say, healthcare data. You're willing to share it with your hospital or with your provide, uh, you know, service provider in the sense of a physician, but if it gets into the wrong hands, then you worry about it, including maybe even your insurance companies, because they may deny you insurance, they may increase your, your, your insurance premiums, and so on and so forth. So it's no longer about a binary on and off. It's not about, I don't want my healthcare data to go anywhere. I do want it to go to my physician. But beyond that, who else should have access to it, and, and to what level is unclear. Maybe aggregated data is OK, because I believe that if my address is not there, and my phone number is not there, and my, my name is not there. If they categorize me in some kind of an aggregate form and, and actually use that to be able to deliver better outcomes based on some analytics from a population health data, then I think most of us will say that's probably okay because it doesn't target me. Nobody knows that it's me that that record belongs to. So there's all kinds of things. And then we talked about security, end-to-end -end security and so on. Right, encryption, decryption, you know, you can do all kinds of other things. But fundamentally, it all boils down to is you got to start thinking about each data, each piece of data, and wh who is it allowed to be accessed by, and to what extent. And so all of a sudden, it's no longer this whole big perimeter that says, I'm just going to encrypt the whole thing, and nobody can ac have access to it. I don't think that that will be the answer. The answer will be on an individual piece of data, to what granularity do I allow or do I, do I want for it to be accessed, and at what point I don't want any access, and at what point do I want it some kind of an anonymized aggregated access. So I think these are all the things that we'll struggle with, and probably my, you know, our belief is we're going to get it wrong a bunch of times before we get it right. right? You, you can either go one, one side, which says I don't want anything to happen and everything is sacrosanct. The problem with that is you don't get the benefit. So it'll swing the other way. The pendulum will swing the other way, and people will give out more data. And then suddenly you will have a few, you know, some of these target breaches and other things that have happened. Suddenly you get all scared, and then we, we go, we, the pendulum will swing the other way. But in, in general, I think where we should end up is where it's all dictated by the specific piece of data. So I think that's kind of hopefully something that you all think about and come up with the right answers so that we'll continue to you know, do good for the, for the, for the society, I think. So that's, that's kind of our view. Thank you, Sam. And uh, actually, I will be sure that we get around this uh, issue about security and privacy. And, and you, you ended with talking about that. And I, I wanted, uh, you know, your, your, the, the three other peers. How do you think, who, to begin with, who should own the data about us? Should it be, you know, like Google that knows everything <laughs> you know, about me? Or should it be me we only should. owning it? Or would it be you, you know? I can, I, well, it's a slippery slope. Let's, let, me, let me give an example. I used to, uh, beforehand, I used to work for Philips, and they made these uh, sleep apnea devices. So it's a thing, a mask you wear, wear during your sleep um, um, to, to um, make your sleep healthy and, and make sure that the apnea doesn't, uh, doesn't come up. Um, and, and Philips collected usage statistics on these devices just to make sure if everything was working properly and if they could learn to improve the devices and stuff like that. But at the moment that the insurance companies learned that adherence uh, rates uh, were actually available per person, they started to demand these, these uh, adherence uh, statistics in order to reimburse them. And every, anybody who didn't use the device in less than 40% 40, 40 of the nights for at least four hours wouldn't get reimbursed anymore. So and even if the technology was not at all intended uh, to fall in the wrong hands or the data was not intended to fall in the wrong hands, it's a very slippery slope. And we have to be really careful what kind of technologies and sensing uh, technology we actually built. Uh, because it can, can go in the wrong direction. And, and I mentioned all the sensors in the cars you are building, Greg. They can also uh, measure how I'm actually driving, which is quite safe. My husband can confirm that's, that. That's right. I'm <laughs> sure Always it is. here, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, our records verify that yes. It's but safe. but you, then Nissan will suddenly know, you know, everything about how I drive. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, that's possible. And we're obviously very aware of the sensitivities of the privacy of data. And as all these sensors are created and added onto the vehicle, then there's a lot of different information that we can be collected. One thing that's already happening today, and this isn't through the OEMs, although that's possible, um, is, is insurance companies, for example, sell the little dongles that you can plug into your CAN bus under your dashboard. And if you volunteer this data to the insurance companies, they'll give you a discount on your insurance. And they just verify that you're as safe a driver as you say you are. So, so as Sean mentioned, there's this opportunity to trade, you know, to, that both the insurance company and the customer extracts 
excuse me, extract some value from that data. And they, may, they volunteer that info and they, they give the discount. Uh, well, then uh, let me take it a little bit further. Isn't it uh, uh, most probable that we will eventually give up you know, our entire privacy you know, in trade to, to get all the conveniences and the help we will get and the good yeah. offers, er, you know, Phil? I, I think possibly, but you have to have that choice, right? Mm -hmm. Just this, this well, some of us might drive dangerously, right, or do something that's dangerous. Uh, to say that people will do that doesn't mean that gives you the ability to deny them that liberty. In the same way, certainly the EU has very different regulations about who owns data than the United States does. Um, it's clear you own it. In the sense of, for example, the insurance company could request it from Philips, but it's your decision whether or not the insurance company can receive it. For example, am I going to plug something to the CAN bus? Well, because then I will get a benefit from it, but it's not that suddenly the car company could sell your information to, uh, to the insurance company to get benefit to themselves. And there's you a fundamental so, difference there. We, we, we don't really know what happens to this. the <laughs> NSA uh, regulation. No, but, but seriously, I know this is not to be paranoid. I just want your thoughts on how we... I, this is this challenge we have got here that everybody has acknowledged. I, I don't know that we are looking at it right. My personal opinion is I don't know anything about owning the data. And the reason I say that is take the classic case, again, healthcare. I keep coming back to that. You own your healthcare data. But how hard is it to take that data? You know, I come to Stanford, you know, I go to Palo Alto Medical and I have to go to Stanford for something. Have you ever tried taking that data from Palo Alto Medical to give it to Stanford? <laughs> it's a nightmare. <laughs> it takes you, you know, days. You've got to run around. You've got to fill 100 forms. And you've got to get a, a you know, CD and you've got to take it over there. So potentially it is my data. But see how hard it is? And then who owns it now? Right? So I'm not sure that we should be thinking about ownership of data. We should be thinking about access to that data. Right, you know, for example, the, the, I talked about the Nielsen ratings. It's data about people's viewing habits. But realistically, who owns that de data? In fact, it is being sold, right? It's being sold to the advertisers. But why did you give up that right? Because they were going to give you something for free. So I think we are all, at the end of the day, we are willing to part with data to specific people for specific access. And I think that's the key. In my mind, we need to look at the access patterns. And, and is that something we're comfortable with? then I think the ownership part of it becomes less relevant. You're much more worried about as long as those people that I've entrusted the data with do the right thing, you're likely to be more confident. If they don't, you're much less likely to be. And when it comes to governments, that's a whole different issue. So I think <laughs> that's where we'll end up. You know. Yeah, and, and what about the security issues? If it is a computer, it can't be hacked. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it can. Yeah. <laughs> Uh. So, so this completely automated car might, you know, so drive me somewhere I don't want to go. That is absolutely a concern. <laughs> yeah. so there's a group of researchers down at uh, UC San Diego, Stefan Savage, done some really great work showing how not sort of default systems that are put into cars, but things that you add on at times can pose security risks. And they don't publish exactly how it works, basically for safety reasons that they go to the government and go to the industry to, to fix these problems. But certainly... Uh, they have demonstrated examples of you send a little wireless packet to a car and it's brakes lock, right, at arbitrary times. And so they f they're fixing these problems, but that's absolutely the case and it's a really big concern. These are embedded systems, often the code can be very vulnerable. Uh, can so you, in your different fields of expertise, uh, tell a little bit about how you deal with solving these challenges about security, you know? What, what? Yeah, so on, on the car side, obviously, at our research center, that's one of our primary focuses because we recognize you know, it's, it's one thing to get your computer hacked. It's another to get your car hacked. And so um, that's why s some would accuse us of being more conservative than maybe we should be because we are concerned about these issues. And um, we want to make sure that, that those risks that are, that are the highest that are mitigated in a very good way. And I will say that auto industries... And that's probably one of the reasons why it might look slower than others would say, is auto industries are actually very good at, and have very good tools in place of anticipating what those risks are and making sure there are redundant systems to prevent those. So I, I can just say that we're, uh, we're partnering with people and making sure that we do take care of that kind of stuff. Yeah, so we're a startup company, and we're active in the healthcare space. So that's, that's naturally very challenging because there's a lot of regulations that we adhere to. Um, so what we do is we really focus on adhering to the regulations. Uh, both in terms of technical and procedural security. So these things are really two separate sides of the same coin, I guess. Um, and, and, and that's what we do, right? Uh, we just do the best we can, but we don't have all the top experts that the big companies have, of course. But it's a very different case. Yeah, yeah I think uh, the other thing, the flip side of it also is 
as uh, you know, uh, he was pointing out in healthcare, there's regulatory compliance, whether it's healthcare, whether it's uh, HIPAA, whether it's uh, financial, so on and so forth. But then there's also the other, uh, the other thing that we need to think about is most things need to have very sophisticated and detailed audit trails. Right? Worst case scenario, you at least need to know that something happened. In most cases, you don't even know what happened. Right? It's well after the fact that suddenly wakes up and says, how did that, ha you know, why is this happening? But if you actually had at least some audit trails, then potentially you can start detecting them before some calamity and try to take some corrective steps. And I think this is how, in the future, we'll sort of come to the point where we all feel comfortable that the security is sufficient. There's always going to be cases where somebody will break in. There'll always be, you know, software inherently will have bugs. There's, <laughs> there's nothing we can do about it. And yeah. I think that's, that's how we need to work. I think there's also a part here about physical security in the sense of often you can keep a system, a digital system secure if it obeys similar rules to physical security, such as it might have electronic records, but if the only person who can access them is the person in this office, then there's a degree of security that affords. And I would actually argue things like the cloud are exactly contrary to that. Suddenly all of this data is in the cloud. Well, if any cloud provider has a mistake, as opposed to, well, some person had to come into your house and steal your data off of encrypted data off of your hard drive. And so there is, I think, a tension there about convenience versus security. But for things like the cloud, I mean, this happened to be, like the reason why the cloud is so uh, popular and effective is in part because some really low-level networking details about some mistakes people made 20 years ago. And so whether or not we can fix that uh, going forward such that you don't just store things in the cloud, you're actually storing things in your own local home server, be an interesting question. Well, we might change the way we act. Uh, Martha said in the initial uh, speech a bit about a worry of hers uh, and of others, I know, that that some of the um, data-driven decisions we might uh, make will be based on yesterday's paradigms <laughs> as opposed to the solutions and the way we have to operate in the future. Because data is, uh, there's like, you know, it, it's a little bit of a, a mood thing as well if, you're, if you really believe that data can make you make only rational good decisions or <laughs> if there's uh, some uh, other element of craziness or intuition can also make really good decisions. Uh, and uh, do you have some thoughts of that, that, that we might, you know, make, make a censored world with every census uh, connected where we are reproducing the old world instead of reaching real progress? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I mean, we could argue that all this tremendously quantified, quantified self is going to create this new age of reason under which, like, we no longer have hypotheses. Instead, there's just fact. But the f I think the fact of the matter is that it's part of the human condition. We want to lie to ourselves sometimes. Right. Like, mm -hmm. like, no, I'm good. I've been exercising lots. Actually, you haven't exercised <laughs> in 10 days. No, 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 I'm very good. Or you know, it's okay that I have this slice of chocolate cake or whatever the, the issue is. And you know, just for our own emotional well-being. And so where that line will end up being between fictions we maintain for ourselves just for sanity and then the hard, cold reality of the world, I think that's going to be a very interesting question. I think it's partly what uh, Paul had said, right? Yeah. There's, there's the whole, I think there is a, there's a trend and there's a desire to go towards what I call data-driven decision-making, right? Whether it's in business, whether it's in whatever you do. Part of the reasoning, I think, is the speed of adoption of any technology or solution has just accelerated to the point where you could go from being, you know, number one, 80% market share in, in something to literally be a nobody in three years. And we've seen this repeatedly, right? Whether it's in the smartphone era, whether it's to do with social, you know, every single thing, and that's actually decreasing. The amount of time it takes for any particular things to, to go from being dominant to being irrelevant is so short that people are so concerned about making the right decisions, betting on the right trends. But then the flip side of it is, you don't know, you have a lot of data, but is it, is it as, as Paul pointed out, is it coincidence, is it correlation, or is there a causality? That's the hard part in a lot of these things. And so, to your point, you know, we, we keep thinking, oh, if we look at coincidence and think it's causality, because that's what you want to believe. And that's where some of the intuition comes in, is you, you basically believe in something, you, you make you know, the things fit. And, and so I think there's all these things we are still trying to figure out. And, and hopefully in the next five, 10 years, you have enough tools and enough discipline and enough, hopefully, processes that, that have, have people have gone through that allow you to be smarter and hopefully allow you to be more confident about the data, quote unquote data driven decisions you make. And I think that's where we'll see. I want to open up to the audience. Uh, if anybody has questions, uh, then uh, please uh, put them now. Yeah.
Uh, could you maybe go to the microphone, I think? And so we're sure that everybody can hear your question. And please uh, tell your name first. I just wanted to share with you that there's someone in the Valley here who's created an app, a healthcare app, whereby they will go to your healthcare provider and make sure the data gets to the other hospital or whoever else needs it because they've recognized that that is a major uh, obstacle to medical care. So someone here in the Valley has created an app for that and a business that does that. I hope it's secure. I know that. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be helpful. Maybe they could do the same with their school enrollment system here. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so, following in the spirit of, of that question, so that Sham does have a solution for his medical um, data concerns, um, <laughs> two areas that I've been seeing, I've gone to three conferences on very similar topics about data-driven decision-making. I work at Cisco. I'm very glad you guys are using our stats. Yay for marketing. I'm, a, I'm in marketing <laughs> at Cisco. Um, the, the question or, or the comment is, is around the two very hot areas of data application, data analytics that I'm hearing about. One is regulation. And how does data and the availability of data on a mass scale at a private level um, play into crime prevention? And the themes that I'm hearing there is, is actually that when it comes to regulation or crime, it is people that we are most worried about. Having data available to me, having data available, for example, Sham, having your medical data, is not in itself a crime. If I use that data to infringe on your liberties, I am committing a crime. So putting crime prevention aside, right, and regulation takes a long time to catch up, right? The other side that I see data being used generally poorly, and we hear a number, number of examples around insurance, is marketing and sales strategies. And I think that there is actually quite a bit of hope in rapid adoption of data-driven uh, decision-making in marketing and sales. Today, it's being done very poorly. I work in marketing. I've been in sales and marketing 15 years. And I can say today it's being done very poorly. But I think that in the next three years, you're going to see dramatic changes in the way that data is being used appropriately for marketing. And that's why, to some extent, I think all of you are saying, the data will be given up. Today, people are, are hesitant because it's not just about being hurt. It's about being bothered. I shared my data. I clicked that damn checkbox. How do I go back and uncheck that box? I can never find it to uncheck that box. But now people won't leave me alone. If that problem was to be solved, I'm fundamentally not understanding what the real issue is with private consensual data transactions. Hmm. Interesting. Anybody I, want to comment on that? I, I think your, your feeling about data today is being used and analytics is being primarily used in revenue generating functions, which is the marketing and sales. That's where invariably everything goes, right? That, that's true. In t so I don't think there is any doubt in my mind, and I'll agree with you, that I think that's where you'll see a lot of uh, um, use of this data. The thing I'm not so sure about is you talked about uh, sort of private uh, sharing of data by you know, consent. Mm -hmm. The problem is it, it's, it's difficult to, it, today if you don't have the tools to say, again, I came back to that access, right? So I may be happy with you having access to my, my data or my wife, but I may not want the insurance company or maybe someone else, right? Uh, maybe I don't want my parents to know, you know, the, 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 the problems that I have. So it, it's, it's, very, it's very contextual as well as the type of data it's dependent on. So I'm not sure that there is a one single answer that you'll ever find. And that's why I'm, I'm a little nervous when we keep talking about, you know, whether it's security or encryption or privacy. There is no one answer. Every bit of data needs to be thought through about what does it mean, how does it need to be shared, and, and what are the, uh, the controls that's needed. And yet, at the same time, it's got to be pretty easy. If I have 50 pieces of data and I have to go on each piece of data, I've got to figure out. It's like saying each file will have different permissions. That's not feasible either. So I think that's the re real problem that we're seeing, at least, is how do you make this easy enough, but at the same time safe enough? We're talking now about the, the on the individual level how it will be the security and the privacy, but what about companies and That's organizations? Do you think to gain the full potential of these technologies that companies and organizations, governments, would also have to be more transparent, you know, with their data? Do you see that happen? Or do you think they will be cleverer than that? <laughs> uh huh. 
Well, it could be quite one. useful to yeah. know, you know, to know all the data of Google or Nissan or you know whatever. Don't, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't they know? It? Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Do, do you think you will see the same tendency as private persons are giving up, or you know, are more transparent that entities and organizations, companies will do the same? It, 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 so uh, the political science part of that question I won't touch, but uh, you know, but I will say the common theme that we seem to see, and and in some of the research that we've looked at definitely shows that people are remarkably willing to share their data, but unless they have fears, right? They, they don't want to have fears that their data is going to be misused, but if they see value in that, and, and that's kind of the confidence I have, is that if, if, there's, if it's a win-win situation and, and there's value in that, and that, that's where the, I think the government tends to, to step in and, and protect the, the consumer. You know, there's a few examples in, in automotive where technologies are demonstrated to be good for the customer and then it ends up being standard for all vehicles. Uh, in, in, as of 2014, all vehicles, um, or, or, I'm sorry, as of 2014, all vehicles will start to be required to have backup monitors, for example. As of 2012, all vehicles are required to have electronic steering control. Um, so y you see situations where data starts to show that there's valuable use and, and uh, regulations start to happen. I also see uh, examples of the opposite trend, actually. So, for instance, when we were working with ASML on this corporate vitality program for them, they made it very clear from the beginning that they didn't want to have any access to the data of, the, of their employees. It should be stored with us. We should have control. The employees should have control. And their managers shouldn't be able to see it because they were very afraid uh, that it would lead to a lot of bad publicity and that people wouldn't use the solution and stuff like that. So, so companies are also started, and organizations starting to become much more aware of, of the risks of having a lot of data. Okay. I think it, it all oh, depends sorry, on sorry, one last thing. Sorry, it in, will be the very last comment here. In, in, in between organizations like companies and governments, I think that the thing to realize is governments are not, don't ever intend to be transparent. They'll get dragged into being transparent. It's not their nature to say, I want to be transparent, I want to tell you everything that's going on. Typically, that's the way in most governments, right? Uh, corporations, on the other hand, are primarily driven by what works for them in their line of business, right? It's not so much altruism or anything else at the end of the day, like we are terrified of consumer data because we just, we are, for us, the bread and butter is consumers, so any data we have of them is, is, is something that we treat very, very carefully. We don't want to do anything about it. Frankly, even if we collect a little bit, we're just terrified of touching it. Whereas you have net-centric companies, you know, the Googles and the Facebooks, then that's their business. And so they deal with it and they're comfortable dealing with it. So I think it's all a matter of what business you're in and how do you then deal with that data and what's, what's more harmful for you? Is it, is it okay to have some mishaps because that's your primary bread and butter? Or a mishap like that could cost us our entire business. Then we tend to be much more careful. So I think it's all motivated by what it is. Again, it's all contextual, unfortunately. There is no single answer, I think. Thank you so much, all four of you. Thank you. Thank you, Naya.